Larry Kudlow, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It is my great pleasure, Ben. Appreciate it. I Thanks wanted to uh, talk to you about a number of different things, but first I just got to ask you, mm. what do you believe is the worst sign about the current economy and the best sign? Um, <clears throat> good question. So I would say the worst signs are people are working, they have jobs, they're earning wages, but the inflation rate is above what they're earning. So in the parlance of the economy, real wages are falling, and they've been falling for two years. And it's the soft underbelly of the so-called Biden economy. And people are overestimating the jobs numbers uh, not that that's bad. I mean, I, I want folks to work, uh, unlike the Fed. Maybe we'll get to that. The Fed doesn't want <laughs> yeah. people to work. But uh, the jobs are not sufficient. It's not the right metric for prosperity that it used to be because um, their earnings are underwater mm -hmm. and their standard of living is falling. And um, I think that's the downfall of the economy. Look at last year, just to say this, Biden's first full year, which was 2022, mm -hmm. The economy grew by 0.9%, and the inflation was 65 So it wasn't a good economy. A lot of people are overestimating the economy right now because we had a big jobs number in January, uh, and we had pretty good retail sales, although adjusted for inflation, not. But I wouldn't, you know, I don't think uh, the economy is in great shape. So, but that's, that's probably the worst. The, I, I would say quickly the other side, Ben, um, the index of manufacturing output is now fallen four straight months. Uh, we'll get new numbers, but not for a while. Um, that's not good. That's a very bad thing. I know people say consumers are t consumer spending is two thirds of the economy. That is true, but it's not true because under the hood, it's business to business. It's what businesses are making and what businesses are selling. Uh, remember, businesses hire workers. And all that looks very sloppy and very weak. Why doesn't the Fed want more people to work? You know, that's a great, um, it, it's, uh, it's called the Phillips curve. Yeah. If you give me a second, <laughs> I don't want to turn people off. No, 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 no this, is, this, is, this is a podcast. It's what it's for. But uh, the idea is when the unemployment rate goes down, the inflation rate goes up. Uh, too many people working causes inflation. All right, now, this is just wrong on so many counts. There was a guy named A.W. Phillips, okay? And I, I think this is correct. He was a New Zealander, and he wound up teaching school at one of our universities. Now, he, in the, I don't know, late 40s or early 50s, he came up with the Phillips curve. But here's what the Phillips curve said. If unemployment rate goes down, wages go up. Wages are not inflation by themselves. And that is true, by the way. And, and we're seeing that now. The unemployment rate is about 3.5%. And the wage tracker from the Atlanta Fed is, uh, whatever it is, 6.25%. Those are good numbers. Those are great numbers, in fact. Those are prosperity numbers. But wages by themselves, it depends. If the productivity is good, they're earning it. Okay. Um, that happens not to be the case now, which is too bad. But um, Milton Friedman taught us differently that inflation is uh, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's too much money chasing too few goods. OK, uh, that's what we've had the past uh, couple of years. The money was mandated for all the covid emergency stuff mm -hmm. and the Federal Reserve bought the bonds that were sold to finance the COVID emergency stuff, most particularly the um, so-called, uh, whatever, American Relief Act in yeah. March of 21, where Democrats like Jason Furman and Larry Summers said, don't do this, don't do this. They were completely right. Conservatives like me said it. And the Fed, so they borrowed money. The Fed bought the bonds, poured money supply in, and we had too much money chasing too few goods. I'm just saying wages buy them. You, you can have an economy with low unemployment and good wages, but not general inflation. Mm -hmm. Prices don't have to go up, okay? 
They just, they don't have to. Now, I'll give you examples. Um, my favorite Democrat, John F. Kennedy, who was a supply sider, cut taxes. Um, the 1960s had uh, 5.5% growth. The unemployment rate was like 35 something. And the inflation rate was nil. I mean, nil, what do I mean by 1% or 2% for seven years? And uh, in my time with Reagan, uh, you know, he cut tax rates and deregulated and so forth. We had over 5.5% growth from 1982 to 1989. Uh, and the inflation rate was a little higher, but he inherited a 15% inflation rate. But basically, the inflation rate was about 3 mm-hmm. so Trump cut taxes. Uh, unemployment fell to three and a half percent. This is probably the best example, even though it's unfortunately only a couple of years pre-pandemic. Um, when when Trump slashed the corporate tax rate, the unemployment rate went to three and a half percent. Minority unemployment set new record lows, and the inflation rate was one and a half percent. So this idea that jobs are bad and wages are bad, the so-called Phillips curve, but the Federal Reserve institutionally is wedded to this academic theory, Mm -hmm. which is really a a subversion of what A.W. Phillips did. This is not unusual in the economics profession. I'm telling you. Keep, you know, you would say, well, if the model doesn't work, get rid of the model. No, Mm -hmm. economists don't get rid of the model. Mm -hmm. I had Senator Kennedy on today. He's a very smart guy. Mm -hmm. Very smart guy. But he started in telling me that the unemployment rate he's, was low. He's a, he's a great uh, example of someone who has thrived in the South by having people think that he is not a brilliant man, but he's actually like the smartest being. He literally yeah. is, is, is an incredible brain. Yes, this. terribly smart. <laughs> so. And actually, he and I, we had some moments when I was in the White House, but we'd become pretty good pals. Mm-hmm. And, I was, and his intellect is very strong. But he was kind of flirting with the Phillips curve today, and I, I kind of drew the moved the interview uh, mm-hmm. away from that. I want to ask you about a phenomenon that's going on right now uh, among uh, those. But ben, can I yeah, just sure. can I just cap this? Sure. Um, Jay Powell and the Fed are right now to want to raise rates some more, and. Um, uh, keep pulling cash out of the economy. Mm-hmm. But the reason is not because of a strong economy or low unemployment rate. He said today we have to raise rates because the economy is too strong. Mm-hmm. What he should have said is we have to raise rates because prices are too strong. Mm-hmm. So you've got your CPI at six and a half. The Cleveland Fed median CPI, which chops off the high and the low prices, is 7.1. Other measures are similar. That's the reason that the inflation indexes are showing too much inflation. Mm -hmm. And the solution, to go back to Milton Friedman, you have to pull some more cash out of the economy and rates will go up. By the way, it doesn't have to destroy the economy. I just don't like it when he puts it in those terms. Uh, And then my friend and mentor, Art Laffer, would tell you, and I totally agree, on the supply side of the economy, here's where Biden is destroying the supply side of the economy with his regulations, Mm -hmm. destroying it. Mm -hmm. And if you hear, if you have a certain amount of money and you have a bunch of apples and you produce more apples with the same amount of money, what happens? Prices come down. Apple yeah. prices come down. Right? More apples, same money. Mm-hmm. But if you have a certain amount of money and apples dwindle, mm-hmm. then the price of the apples, which are scarce, goes up. Mm-hmm. That's the way Jay Powell should explain to the American people that he has to do what he's doing because prices are still rising too rapidly and they should get back to their 2% target. And then he should stand there and blame Congress for all of its spending. Spending is the root cause of this in this cycle. There's no question about that. So sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's fine. Um, There's something going on on the American right right now that I'd like you to talk about a little. Uh, And uh, 
Former President Trump has weighed in on it, but it's really something that's coming from a lot more sources than that. And it's essentially this frame that says for most of uh, the the sort of Reagan and, and, and further on history of uh, the Republican Party over the prior uh, 35 years or so, uh, we had a certain attitude, attitude toward the economy, and we now think that's bad and something we don't want to go back to. And, and it, it's almost, you know, cutting against the, the Ryan tax cuts, you know, uh, it was talking about Reagan Republicanism in a negative way when it comes to the economy. Uh, and it seems to be something that a lot of the former president's supporters are, are gravitating toward. What I'm curious about is how serious you think that actually is. Because from my perspective, there are a lot of people who, you know, have made a lot of predictions about the ideological direction of the country. Um, and yet, uh, when it comes to economic principles, I would argue that Republicans have been pretty darn consistent on these fronts uh, for uh, quite some time. I, we'd like to see them spending less. Uh, but certainly, the idea of casting aside Republican orthodoxy or conservative orthodoxy. What specifically are you thinking about? Well, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, the idea that Social Security and Medicare have to be completely off the table. They can, oh. We can't have any reforms, which, of course, leads to, okay, so you're only going to do it with, you know, a third of the spending, effectively. Mm. And then you have to find it from there. And then there there seems to be, you know, less and less of an appetite to even cut there in the sense that, you know, they don't want to be framed as being, uh, you know, greedy Republicans taking food stamps away from oh, people. And right. Like. Um, and that seems to have gained – some new truck in, in mm. recent years as a lot of these folks have proposed the idea that, you know, a, a more left of center economic approach uh, that, that they always tend to describe as being pro worker mm. um, is one that uh, ought to be adopted. No one is helped more by the application of free market capitalism than the workforce. Yes. All right. And that is pure cuddling. <laughs> but unfiltered as as one of the only living people uh at least in the economic sphere who worked for both reagan and trump yes okay um uh, i can say that uh they both believe they both would agree with that mm -hmm. now there are issues but i just want to make that point uh trump the businessman mm -hmm who cut taxes and regulations, uh, was acutely sensitive to the worker. In fact, in may, many ways, worked hard and succeeded in m making the Republican Party the party of the worker, mm -hmm. which I wholly agree with. But Reagan was the same way. Yeah. Reagan is exactly the same way. That's who he talked about. And he came from, you know, a very humble uh, mm -hmm. beginnings. Okay? Now, Social Security is, Medicare is more interesting. And complicated. Um, I would agree with my former boss, President Trump, that uh, in this cycle, which is the probably a continuing resolution that will raise the debt ceiling in mm -hmm. return for spending cuts. Mm -hmm. In this cycle, uh, Medicare and Social Security should be off the table. But just for this little cycle, Reagan was much smarter, Ben. Reagan created a bipartisan commission to deal with a looming catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And I know I was uh, one of the secretaries on that commission. Greenspan was the big shot. Pat Moynihan, the late Senator Moynihan, who was a friend of mine, the last Democrat I worked for was Pat Moynihan. Mm -hmm. Lane Kirkland of the AFL CIO and a variety of big shots in both parties. Reagan was very smart. And, um, he said, you go, take a year or two, and come back to me. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. It worked. And they came up with a bipartisan deal, which, um, I don't know, depending on events, lasted 40 years, 45 years, mm -hmm. almost 50 years. Now, Republicans right now should take a page from Reagan and augur for a bipartisan commission. So I had Rand Paul on the show a few weeks back. Nobody's smarter. 
friend of mine, mm-hmm. good friend of mine, and said that. I said, Senator, you, you know, and he said he had a bill to create a bipartisan commission, and it got nowhere. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, uh, that's what they need to do. Because, mm-hmm. look. Um, you have to have bipartisan ownership of this. You have to. Yeah. It's just too delicate and politically sensitive. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. And Biden is so duplicitous in hammering away and blaming Republicans. Uh, the numbers show uh, Medicare is going to run out sooner, mm-hmm. probably in a half a dozen years, and then Social Security in uh, nine or ten years. Biden's budget, uh, which has been leaked out starting today, we covered it mm-hmm. on our show, uh, he's just going to raise taxes on so-called rich people. Yeah. That's a non-starter. Yeah. And, you know, but anybody who walked in and said, we're just going to cut cut Social Security benefits, mm-hmm. that's a non-starter. And by the way, I don't want to cut their benefits. Mm-hmm. In other words, there are reform measures mm-hmm. that could be put into play in both entitlements. But you need bipartisan political cover. I mean, the last person who I remember, you know, in the Senate, you know, having a real go at this uh, was when, you know, Tom Coburn got mm-hmm. together with a couple of other guys mm-hmm. and, you know, push for, you know, a very slow raising of the age mm-hmm. because obviously these programs were never meant to cover as much of the percentage of American life as they've turned out to have to. Now, that's a good thing because people are living longer and that's good, but they weren't designed for that. They were designed to be old age benefits at a point where the American lifespan was much shorter than it is now. And the the concern that I have is basically this. I'm not supposed to be alive, Ben. You're not. Well, I, I'm not, <laughs> don't say things like that. God <laughs> willing. God bless. And I go to church on Sunday. I'm 75 years old. Uh, yeah. By the way, I feel pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, but they didn't figure. Yeah. That LPJ didn't figure that when he was. That's correct. <laughs> so, that's correct. So my point is this. I have a, a two and a half year old daughter and I have a six week old daughter. And yeah. I look at them and I know none of this is going to be around for them. These programs will go, they they will go the way of the dodo unless there is major change to the way that they work and function because otherwise, in order for America to to do the things necessary in terms of being on the hook for that amount of money, the country would have to fundamentally change. And, uh, and I worry that by setting that aside and, and viewing it as something not part of the Republican agenda anymore, namely fiscal responsibility uh, uh, or any attempt at it, that that's going to, you know, the, the, the change will be more likely to go the way that Bernie Sanders and a lot of these other folks want it to go mm. than the way that you and I want. Well, that's an interesting point, the socialist view. You're, you're probably right politically. Um, listen, Republicans have to be smart. They, I'm telling you, just do what we're into. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of important reforms, including a uh, slow increase in the retirement age. I, I think that's part of it. Um, people should have the option of investing mm-hmm. and not just investing in the stock market. If you want to, it's like the federal retirement uh, uh, funds yeah. in the, that you get in the government. Um, there's bond funds and stock funds and old international funds. Uh, or I saw something, I don't know all about this. I think I'm on a conference call tomorrow with uh, Bill Cassie, Senator mm-hmm. Cassie, but um, he and Mitt Romney and a few others are looking at a sovereign investment fund yes I, i'm interested in that uh just because that could be a some kind of and they would invest it in index funds like for the long run mm-hmm. which is how you should invest but republicans in recent years spend too much can yeah. i just say that oh absolutely and you can with definitely the, send that to, say that to me <laughs> with the greatest of, of regret <clears throat> my former boss was guilty mm-hmm. he just was we russ vote we had an omb cabal uh uh, Russ Vo was OMB director. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mick Mulvaney was OMB director before he was chief. And I wasn't, but I worked in Reagan's OMB. So we call it the OMB cabal in Oval Office meetings. And we were always pushing uh, to, you know, keep the, um, uh, keep the spending uh, parameters in place, the spending limits, sequestration if you broke them. Uh, which goes all the way back to Phil Graham and Warren Rudman yep. in the mid '80s. Phil Graham is a mentor of mine, still alive today, great man. Uh, it's what John Boehner did: spending caps, sequestration, um, 
And President Trump, uh, yeah. he was, the, the, the anecdote was, um, we, in the last budget, pre-COVID, uh, we got him to sign on to it mm -hmm. in the meeting, in the old. And a day or two later, I went out. I mean, I said to him, can I go out with this? Mm -hmm. said, yes, that's our policy. Blah, blah, blah. So a couple of days later, I went out uh, to the front lawn and did some <laughs> cable show and said yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Russ Vogt, who I love, called me up to congratulate me. <laughs> <laughs> About 10 days later, somebody asked the president and said, no, <laughs> this is a true story. All right. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, read it and weep. Yes, but he uh, he just wasn't uh, yeah. good on that. Yeah. I kidded him. We had a dinner. Uh, it must have been in the autumn of 2021 when they were debating the so-called infrastructure bill. I think that's when it was. And we were at um, Bedminster. A bunch of, you know, old Trump guys, 10, 12 guys. And um, he, the boss, and one or two others was railing mm -hmm. about the trillion-dollar infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. which had some Republican support. <laughs> I just looked up to him. I said, sir, you won $3 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. Yes, yes. All right, I speak the truth because yeah, yeah. I was the point guy. So, yes, if you're talking about spending, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Because uh, Reagan was very tough on domestic spending, mm -hmm. military spending. He was a hawk. Well, and I think a part of the concern that we have here is if you believe, as I do, as as uh, Bridge Colby does, as a lot of the folks who I respect on on uh, foreign policy, there's a good, great piece in the Wall Street Journal from uh, two days ago. If we are entering a new period of great power conflict, mm -hmm. then the military spending side of things is going to start to look a lot more like it's mm -hmm. uh, like it's the '80s again. But 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 but. Mm -hmm. In order to do that properly, without bankrupting the country, you have to grow the economy. Yeah. At uh, get back to the historic forty or fifty year norm from nineteen forty seven to two thousand, this economy grew three and a half percent per year. Mm -hmm. In the Reagan years, as I said earlier, it grew at five percent after the end of the recession for seven years. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Reagan goes to Reykjavik and outbids Gorbachev. Reagan says, I will never pull Star Wars. We are going to go ahead with it. He and said, you don't have the resources to match me. Mm -hmm. Checkmate. Yeah. But today we're growing. First of all, the last year we hardly grew at all. Mm -hmm. But the trend line today is like one and a half. Mm -hmm. You can't beef up the military and be strong at one and a half percent GDP growth. Okay, this is where free market capitalism and incentives comes into play, Ben. Reagan said peace through strength, peace through strength. But that strength part included the economy, and he knew that better than anybody. Uh, I want to wrap up. So with quit how, spending yeah. and taxing and regulating. I want to wrap up with something that's a little different. Um, I'm sure you're aware of and have paid attention to this phenomenon of the growth of uh, uh, DEI mm -hmm. uh, backed by, uh, you know, uh, billions of dollars of government spending mm -hmm. both within our government institutions and in corporate institutions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on there. I did think it was funny, by the way, the other day on Bill Maher that, that Bernie Sanders seemed apparently unaware of this. He couldn't tell the difference between equality and equity. Um, uh -huh. I encourage you to watch the clip. You may want to use it yeah. on your show. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your view of this trend and mm -hmm. how we can push back. Oh, it's very bad. Awful. It, it seems very toxic, Awful. deeply un-American, mm -hmm. and yet it's embedded in so many of these mm -hmm. corporations with a younger cohort of, of people, a little younger than me, who are essentially taking over these departments and then using them to – in ways that are, you know, really go against, I would view, you know, American principles. Uh, mm -hmm. And the problem is that I think a lot of people look at that and they throw their hands in the end and say, what are we supposed to do about it? What can we do? About it? Yeah, well, that's a really important point. Um, we should be, you know, America's a meritocracy and, um, you know, endowed by our creator. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in, 
all men are equal. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are equal. That doesn't mean we are at the finish line equally. It means we're at the starting line. And as somebody who was a civil rights Republican, um, we passed a lot of great legislation. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden's Selma speech the other day was disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the GOP that pushed that agenda, yeah. not the Democrats. But people have to speak up. The point is they have to speak up. So you, what you have now in the government, I think the worst of it, frankly, is in the government. Yeah. It started with Obama. Then we cut it off pretty much during the Trump years. Now Biden has, you know, raised it to the hundredth power. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusiveness, and all that um, should not be the criteria uh, for jobs. Mm -hmm. Should not. Mm -hmm. um, affirmative action. Uh, which I thought we had pushed back, is now rearing its ugly head again. And discriminating, for example, against Asians. Yes. I mean, go figure. Ridiculous. Uh, and other groups. Uh, Asians, I don't know how you, Chinese, Indians, mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. um, car, some of that is in the corporations, um, but probably not so much because these companies have a share price that trades on the market. Mm -hmm. And if investors see that they're running... Uh, you know, a welfare company, a daycare company, a DEI company, uh, an ESG company, they'll walk away yeah. and the stock price will go down. My favorite example is what Elon Musk has done. Yeah. But it's happening elsewhere. Uh, even Disney, um, you know, I know that um, the Santa's come after them. But actually, uh, Bob Iger, who's come back for a couple of years, realizes this is crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Disney Plus getting killed. Nobody wants to stream on. Because it's all crap. You know, bring back Mickey Mouse, for Christ's sake. The real Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Minnie Mouse. I miss Minnie Mouse. Well, can, can I just tell you, as uh, someone with young kids, the, the Mickey content is some of the worst content. I know. We have to turn to... We, why are we importing Peppa Pig? <laughs> and it's a tragedy. Yeah. Because these are so American, you know, institutions. Yeah. But I think um, it may be that laws have to be passed. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't like that solution as a rule. Yeah. I'd much prefer the uh, public opinion solution. P you know, thought leaders speaking out, but ordinary people speaking out. Yeah. I mean, I loved it when the parents went into the schools yeah. and said no. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, Merrick Garland called with his pants down. I mean, that's yeah. just so American. Yeah. Parents going into the schools. Um, and that was a big factor. Yeah. And to me, that's the way you have to deal with that. That's the best I don't like governments singling out businesses because then I worry that's going to spread into other areas. Yeah. Um, I don't like the woke agenda any more than you do, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying you got to speak out. I mean, one of my favorites. So they passed this. Um, stay with me on this. You'll enjoy it. The $300 billion chips uh, yes. bill, right? Yes. It passed and everybody wanted it because we need new semiconductors. And I looked at that and I said, no, this is complete. A list of requirements. That was, this is industrial <laughs> policy at its worst, number one, non-market industrial yeah. policy. And then I said, you wait and see once you get to the fine print, because spending begets regulations, and these left-wingers are going to believe yep. me. Yep. So I'm at, um, uh, we had lunch, Committee of Prosperity, uh, for, with Glenn Youngkin. Yes. who's terrific. I yeah. think the world of Glenn, governor of Virginia. And he got to talking about that. And he said he, he, uh, he's, he was in favor of industrial policy for chips, for semiconductors, but he just doesn't understand uh, uh, the daycare centers. Yes. And, and, and I said, well, Glenn, actually, when you have $300 billion spending bills and you have this crap, you're going to get daycare centers, yes. not yes. chips. Okay? And he's like, well, I can see the bulb go off. <laughs> and he asked me, he said, we, we need to have some quality time together. But that's a perfect – so that stuff has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, sure, I, you need a conservative Congress, but you need a conservative in the White House too. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, you know, all my wish list of things culturally, economically, <laughs> religiously, blah, blah, blah. You just need a strong guy in the White House with good conservative values. I mean, that is so crucial because mm -hmm. um, it becomes political, yeah. right? I mean, there's no – you can have the power of the purse, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm betting with McCarthy. I like what McCarthy's doing uh, so forth. Mm -hmm. But to really make 
seismic changes. Mm -hmm. Look, that's what the Bidens have done. Mm -hmm. I mean, in two years, look what they've done. Yeah. And they've done it, in fairness, they've done it with the whole of the bureaucracy at their back. I know. Willing to do whatever they want to do versus when Republicans get elected, bureaucracy just digs in their heels, takes as long as they as they want. It that, can you know. be tamed. Yeah. Uh, look, this Russ has obviously a solution on that. You know, yes. When it comes to yes. Uh, you know, and that's something there are that things I think, we can do. Yeah, but still, it's you know, you're dealing. Trump with, had a good. You know, we were going to throw it. Yeah. We were going to make them. It, it, Just fifty thousand, though, and fifty thousand, they were squealing already well, at the Washington Post. Not a bad start. <laughs> no, no, it's a start. It's a start. But you know, you're with I was million. there. Reagan tried to do something similar a long yeah. time ago, but he, it's not easy. No. I get it. No. So I, I, I just think, to me, that's that's the biggest question that I have about the next Republican president. Are you going to be willing to do what it what is necessary mm. to? Not just tame the bureaucracy, but but crack the whip over them in a way that you know, prevents them from continuing to do what they've done for so long. I just want Ben. Uh, I'm not asking for much. I just want some free market, capitalist, uh, religious freedom, mm-hmm. school choice, close the borders, mm-hmm. stop the spending, <laughs> traditional American values, <laughs> merit. Work requirements for social... De- Is that asking too much? And my two that's, front teeth. That's all I ask. Turn the spigots back on for oil and gas. It's it's just a short list. Yeah. And the great part is, honest to goodness, it's such a blessing. I get I have this uh, program on TV. I got a radio show, and I just bellyache on this yeah. stuff constantly. <laughs> it's great. It's it great. is great. It's the most fun I've ever had. Larry Cudlow, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. My pleasure, Ben. Pleasure, really.